along with Americans such as Woody Herman and Nat King Cole, was considered a giant during the golden age of Cuban music. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. Our guest is Richard Wolff, a professor emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, now at New School University, author of a number of books, including Democracy at Work, A Cure for Capitalism. I want to talk about austerity here at home. This is House Speaker John Boehner speaking last month, defending the $85 billion budget sequester cuts that took effect on March 1st. The American people know the president gets more money, they're just going to spend it. And the fact is, is that he's gotten his tax hikes. It's time to focus on the real problem here in Washington, and that is spending. House Speaker John Boehner, uh, Professor Richard Wolf, your response, and also uh, that the Obama administration was warning catastrophe if sequestration took place. It took place. Well, it's a stunning comment on our dysfunctional government built on top of a dysfunctional economy. Here we are in the middle of a crisis. We have millions of people without work, millions of people losing their homes, uh, an economy that doesn't work for the vast majority. The United States government is one of the major customers for goods and services in America. Sequestration is simply a cutback in government spending. It doesn't take rocket science to understand that if the government, as the largest single buyer of goods and services, cuts back on the goods and services it buys, that means companies across America will sell less, and they'll have less need of workers, and they will lay off workers. So this is an act that worsens an unemployment that is already severe. If you put that together with the tax increase at the, on January 1st, and let me say a word about that. We heard a lot of public debate about taxing rich people, not taxing rich people, Republicans and Democrats. But the tax on the wealthy is small compared to the tax on the middle and lower incomes that went up on January 1st. When we raised the payroll tax here in America from 4.2 to 6.2 percent, we raised over $125 billion, huge amount of money, much more than was raised by taxing the rich. And we savaged the middle and lower income group in America, those that in the presidential election both candidates had sworn to save and support, we attacked them, thereby limiting their capacity to buy goods and services, because we taxed them more. You put together the taxing of the middle and lower incomes with the cutbacks of government spending, and you're going to do what every European country that has imposed austerity has already discovered. You're making the problem worse. So with all the homilies that Mr. Boehner can put out there about how spending is a problem, this abstract idea doesn't change the fact you're making the economic conditions of the mass of people worse by these austerity steps, not better. And that ought to be put as the fire burning at the feet of politicians so they stop talking these abstractions and deal with the reality of what they're doing. So what do you think needs to be done? A radical change in, in the policies. And I think it has to go far beyond simply reversing this austerity program, which, again, just for a word about history, back in the 1930s, the last time we had a breakdown of our capitalist system like this, we didn't have austerity. We didn't have cutbacks. We had the opposite. Roosevelt, in the middle of the 30s, created the Social Security system, went to everybody over 65 and said, I'm going to give you a check for the rest of your life. He created the unemployment compensation system, giving all the unemployed for the first time checks every week for a year or two. And he created a public employment program and hired millions of workers. It's the opposite of austerity. So any politician who says we must do this because there's no option has forgotten even the American history of not that long ago. So the first thing I would do is go in that direction. Not austerity, but its opposite. But I want to go further because I think our problem is deeper. This crisis wasn't supposed to happen. When it happened, it wasn't supposed to last a long time. All of that has been proven false. The problems run deep. And I think what we have to do, and what that book tries to do, is to talk about reorganizing our economy so that for the first time we can say, we're not only going to get out of this crisis, we're taking the kinds of steps that can prevent us from having them over and over again as our unstable, business cycle-ridden economy keeps imposing on us. So for me, it's the more profound change that we finally have to face, painful as it is, after 50 years of, of a country unwilling to face these questions, I think we need basic change, and that's what I spend most of my time stressing.
Before we talk about the basic change, democracy at work, as you right. put it, um, what could Obama do without congressional support right now? Well, I think in many ways he could initiate a public employment program. I think it's long overdue that he find all the ways available to him to say what Roosevelt said. And not that Roosevelt did everything correctly and not that he's a, a genius or any of that, but to take some lessons from those people in a in our country before, who took steps that were su successful. I mean, Roosevelt didn't plan on doing this when he first took office. Absolutely. He had pressure from below. The CIO, the biggest union organizing drive in American history, never had anything that successful before. As an AFL-CIO. That's right. And with the socialists and communist parties, who were strong at that time, working with them, they organized millions of Americans into unions who had never joined a union before, and they pushed from below in a very powerful way. And they changed Mr. Roosevelt, showing that politicians, if subject to pressure from below, can change. Same lesson that Cyprus has just taught us yet again. So my response is learn from that. Roosevelt went on the radio to the American people and said, basically, if the private sector either cannot or will not provide work for the millions of Americans that need and want to work, then it's my job as president to do it. And he did it. And I think Mr. Obama could and should overcome whatever has made him hesitate. We in this country not only don't have a federal employment program, the Republicans and Democrats haven't even put it on the floor to debate it as an important issue, even though it comes out of our own history. So I would say, put us, put our people to work. They want to work. The Federal Reserve says 20 percent of our tools, equipment, factory and office space is sitting idle, unused. So we have the people who want to work. We have the tools, equipment and raw materials for them to work with. And Lord knows we need the wealth they could produce. Put them to work and make it a national issue that that happened. Where does the money come from? Well, Roosevelt went to the wealthy and he went to the corporations and he said to them, you must give me the money to take care of the mass of people, because if you don't, we're going to have a catastrophe in this country. We're going to have a social revolution. My argument is, let's go back to the same tax rates that Roosevelt imposed or at least in that neighborhood, which is much higher on wealthy people and much higher on corporations than we have today. That's what he did. That's how he funded it. And in case our politicians are worried, let's remind them. Mr. Roosevelt, who took those daring steps, was reelected to be president four consecutive times, the most popular president in American history. It's not a dead-end political decision. It's the best decision a president could make to leave his legacy in history that we are told our presidents care so much about. We're talking to Richard Wolff, author of Democracy at Work. Again, before <clears throat> we talk about democracy at work, I wanted to go to a recent hearing in Washington. Executives with the banking giant J.P. Morgan Chase appeared before a Senate panel earlier this month to answer questions around the so-called London whale trades that cost the bank more than $6 billion and derailed financial markets worldwide. This is Arizona Republican Senator John McCain criticizing J.P. Morgan's actions. J.P. Morgan completely disregarded risk limits and stonewalled federal regulators. It is unsettling that a group of traders made reckless decisions with federally insured money and that all of this was done with the full awareness of top officials at J.P. Morgan. This bank appears to have entertained, indeed embraced, the idea that it was, quote, too big to fail. Ashley Bacon, J.P. Morgan's interim chief risk officer, testified at the same hearing. I don't think it is too big to fail. I think there's, there's further work that needs to be done to demonstrate and document that, and it's in process. I'm not leading that process or deeply involved in it, uh, but, I, but I think it is, uh, it's something that needs to be demonstrated to everybody's satisfaction. That was Ashley Bacon, J.P. Morgan's interim chief risk officer. Can you explain what took place here and what is happening? Yes. On the question of too big to fail, there really isn't much to say. In 2008, 
our banks failed, all of them, the way the Cyprus banks failed, and for very similar reasons. They took in a lot of depositors' money, and they made risky bets they shouldn't have made, and they failed, and so they didn't have the money to honor their obligations, and they turned to the government for a bailout. And when the government hesitated, because it's public money to bail out a privately failed bank, they were told, in another kind of blackmail, we're too big to fail. If you don't bail us out, we will collapse and take the entire economy with us. And that was a persuasive argument, particularly after they allowed Lehman Brothers to fail, and that nearly did take the economy with it. That was a convincing argument. You would have thought they had then learned the lesson about the problem of a too-big-to-fail financial institution. If you thought that, you would have been wrong, because the same banks that were too big to fail in 2008 are all of them bigger today. So we didn't learn the lesson. We didn't break up the banks. We didn't limit, control their growth. They're bigger now than they were then. And in a sense, maybe shame on them the first time. But having allowed this to happen, it's shame on us. Number two, we seem to need, as a nation, to believe that we have the power to control, limit, or regulate, whether it's the Glass-Steagall Act that came out of our disaster of the 1930s, or the Dodd-Frank Act, which came out of the disaster that started in 2008. We seem to want to believe we can leave in place private banks, no matter how big they are, and hedge them about with regulations. The proof of the whale trades in, in London, the proof of everything we know is that these banks have the money, the staff, the resources to work their way around the regulations at least as fast as we impose them on them. That's what these hearings fundamentally show. They can make trades that are too risky. They can lose wild amounts of money. They can turn to the government and demand to be helped and bailed out each time, and they get it. We are telling them, in a classic example, look, do whatever you want. You don't have any risk of fundamental failure and punishment. Regulation doesn't work, because we leave in place an entity, a large corporation, with the money and the incentives to get around it. Interestingly, Jamie Dimon, the head of J.P. Morgan Chase, did not testify. He was brought before the Senate, what, uh, about uh, last June, right. where the senators were asking him for advice. And then when you looked at the senators on, uh, on the Senate committee and how much money J.P. Morgan Chase had given each of them, we're talking about millions of dollars went to many of them. When I say that the, the big corporations, particularly the banks, have the resources and the incentives, I'm being polite. Yeah, part of the resources are going into literally making sure that the political regulator is a good friend and understands the complexities. In simple English, they are buying their way into the situation we watch, which is, we will pretend to be regretful, you will pretend to be protecting the public, you will make regulations that we help you write so that we can get around them. It, it, it is something that ought not to be allowed to continue, because we're living the economic crisis that comes from that way of doing business. What lessons have been learned since 2008 <clears throat> and today? Uh, could the U.S. see the same situation as Cyprus? Absolutely. We have banks that are literally telling us, because we know from our controls, that they are trying, even, to regenerate it. They're trying to get people to borrow more money again. They're not, we're not changing the wage structure of America, which means that Americans are required to go into debt to supplement their wages. You know, the irony is, we are trying, in the language of some of these folks, to kickstart our economy, to get it going again. But the problem is, our economy was a train heading into a stone wall in the first years of this century. And if we get our economy going again without fundamental changes, what we're doing is putting that same train back on the track, heading towards the same wall. Cyprus shows us what's happening. But we don't have to take just small countries. Take Great Britain our classic ally. Their economy is now in the second, or in some people's minds, the third recession within the crisis since 2007. They are following an austerity problem, a uh, process, exactly like that supported by Mr. Boehner. And the economic downturn in Great Britain is catastrophic for that society. And so we have this image 
of a future for us if we don't make fundamental change, but everyone wants to put it away and pretend that we can let it go by itself or a few regulations will solve the problem. They haven't. They're not doing it now elsewhere. That's not a strategy we should pursue in this country either. When we come back, we'll talk to Professor Richard Wolff about the alternatives, about, well, what he's put forward, democracy at work, a cure for capitalism. This is Democracy Now! We'll be back with Professor Wolff in a minute. Thanks so much for watching this report from Democracy Now!, your daily independent global news hour. We don't accept advertising or corporate funding, but rather rely on donations from viewers like you. Please make your contribution by visiting democracynow.org. We need your support today to keep bringing you this hard-hitting, in-depth reporting.